let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured speakers. Karen Zucker is a director, producer, and journalist who's told stories for more than 25 years, both domestically and internationally. As a producer for ABC's World News and Nightline, she's worked alongside Peter Jennings, Charlie Gibson, and Diane Sawyer. She's covered civil rights, presidential campaigns, and social trends. And she was honored for her role in ABC's coverage of 9-11 with two of television's most prestigious prizes, the Peabody and the Alfred L. DuPont Awards. Zucker was the producer and co-writer of PBS NewsHour series, Autism Now. Her oldest son, Mickey's autism diagnosis, inspired a new direction in her reporting to bring a better understanding of autism realities. John Donvan is a veteran network correspondent and producer for ABC, CNN, and PBS, as well as a contributing editor to The Atlantic. During his journalism career, in addition to anchoring ABC broadcasts, John served as chief White House correspondent and held postings in London, Moscow, Jerusalem, and Amman, Jordan. The winner of four Emmys and the Overseas Press Club Award, he became interested in autism's impact on families upon meeting his wife, physician and medical school professor Ranit Mishori, who grew up in Israel with a brother profoundly impacted by autism. He has two children and lives in Washington, D.C. Please join me, everyone, in a really warm welcome for Karen Zucker and John Donman. Welcome, both of you. Thanks so much for having us. So, John, do you think we should start out for those of you who might not have seen the film with a trailer of In a Different Key? Okay, we've okay. restarted. Okay. I've always known Don. I don't remember not knowing Don. We knew that Don was a little different, different but what it was, we didn't know. He is the first person to be ever diagnosed with autism. At the time, autism wasn't even a word. I had heard that the first person diagnosed with autism might still be alive and living in this small town in Mississippi. It's a field. Hey, Shelby Welby. Hey, Donald. Hey, that's the cat. Hey, well, hi, Don Norman. Hey, Chad, was a plant. I only knew that I was different, and that different was bad. You're weird, you're a freak, you're a retard, you're a loser, you're ugly. These were the things that I heard on a daily basis. Go, 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 go. In my research study, every black family that I've met with has asked a similar question. How do we keep our children safe? How do we fix this situation so that our children won't die? It's a little different. I mean, your brain works a lot differently than most people. Hello. <laughs> hey, Karen. Hi. Hello. Do you get any kind of support from anybody? Not really. It's just me. Nobody's going to do what I do. So you just can't die. Right. It's got to be immortal. Don's got some odd behaviors and some eccentricities, but he's our guy. I was just so drawn to him in this community. I wanted to figure out how did they get it right? Because they really did get it right. That's a wonderful clip to start us off. So John and Karen, obviously through your book, Pulitzer Prize finalist and this wonderful movie, you have committed a considerable amount of time to educating the rest of us about autism. Can you tell us why it was so important to bring the history of autism to the public, to the rest of us through your book and film? Um, we, um, 
we can talk a little bit about why autism matters to us, but the why the film uh, is that we we worked for a long time on stories about autism, as we mentioned, working for ABC News for many, many years and doing stories about autism. Um, and we came to recognize that as much as people who are on the spectrum can try hard to fit in, as much as they get help from people to fit in, like therapists and teachers and their families, that another important part of that whole equation is everybody else, the people who do not have, they think, a connection to autism. Um, you know, the classmates and the workmates and the other people on the bus, the other people in the restaurant, the other people on the street who a person with autism interacts with every day. We, we, we refer to all of those other people as the civilians in the story. <laughs> and we came to recognize that for people on the spectrum to really have a, a real shot to belong, which is what we all want, or almost all of us want to belong, to fit, to, to have connections, to have opportunities. So much of it depends on whether the civilians give them that space or not, welcome them in, support them, accept them, back them up, make friends with them, be good neighbors to them. And so we felt that there was a need for a film that would reach all of the civilians with, a, with an interesting story that tells them a lot of truth, but is ultimately... Um, you know, ultimate, you know, I was so happy to hear Leslie say that the film was ultimately hopeful and that some of it made her angry and some of it made her cry and some of it made her laugh, but it was ultimately hopeful because that's what we want to get across to the civilians. Look, people on the spectrum need you to have their backs. It's not that hard and you'll, and we'll all be better off when you do. So that's why, that's why we made the film. That makes sense. You know, in watching the film and I've seen it now twice, so incredibly moving but I wondered to myself, why is it that you feel that advocacy, especially family advocacy, is so critical for people to understand? I think that's part of what John was um, starting to say in his response, which is we, we as a community, the autism community can, can embrace autism and understand autism, but until people outside of the community um, really understand it fully and see that it's not so hard to have the back of somebody who's different, that, that in fact, people with autism are not so different, but that they do need different things. Um, and, if, and, and with the film, our goal was to, to present the entire spectrum so that people who don't know much about autism or know very, very little would see that there is this huge spectrum of people. And just like there's a huge spectrum of people in the universe, um, you need to understand differences. And in seeing the film, we think people walk away with a, an understanding that you you can't grasp, um, you know, in such a crash course um, as well as the film. So your book and the film both open with the story of Donald Triplett, the first child in the United States diagnosed with autism. Karen, you told me when you started on this journey, you didn't even know whether he was still alive and why is it that it was so critical that that first child get a diagnosis of, of autism? Well, prior to the diagnosis, um, people who were different were just, and, and for many years after, in fact, too, were just sent away for the rest of their lives. Um, people didn't understand them. They were afraid of them. They, um, and families even, um, you know, after Donald was first diagnosed, before people really understood what autism was, were told to put their children away. And without having, you know, autism always existed. Um, it's just that having a case number one, having those, those children um, studied and researched and, and described uh, was the beginning of being able to really help educate them without, without a diagnosis, without knowing what someone, how to help someone, you can't even begin to help them. And yeah, it, to help I, them. I was going to I was going to jump in and say prior to that, um, and it, it was mostly a focus on children at the time. Children who acted like Donald did would, would not only be put in institutions as Donald was for more than a year of his life when he was three years old, but they would be diagnosed as troublemakers or or they would use terms like insane or feeble mindedness, which was kind of like it was like writing them off. It was like it was like dismissing them. And that's why, you know, Karen saying the message parents got was just, you know, put them away. Well, you know, it, some of you were even told, put, put that child away and 
pretend the child doesn't exist, move on with your life. And so having the diagnosis there was, again, as Karen said, it took a long time, but it was the beginning of a process of changing attitudes towards how people should respond to autistic children. And then ultimately, of course, every autistic child becomes an autistic adult. I mean, that story to me was so powerful of the triplet parents, the day that they decided to go get Donald back. Like there was something in them that said, that's not the right setting for my child. But that would have gone against, as you said, Karen, what was happening in society at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, except that Mary Triplet was not like everybody else. Yeah. And, um, and for a number of reasons. One is obviously in her soul, she just didn't believe that her child should be put away and that she needed to do something about it, which is what you know parents all over the world do. Um, but she also had the means and the support um, coming from a wealthy family and, and, a, and at the respect of the town. And she had access to things that most families will, would never have at, had access to at that time in history or ever, you know, even today. People don't own the bank. Um, exactly. The triplet family owned the bank. Exactly. So, you know, I, I noticed that a major theme in both your book and the film is, as you said, Karen, the sense of community and belonging, beginning with Donald Triplett's story as a part of his hometown in Forest, Mississippi. Um, as you say, Karen, the community can learn to do right by someone who's different. It helps to own the bank, right? And it helps to know the principal of the school. But yet there was something in Donald, I think, that made him yeah. be well, we, saw that, we saw that immediately. We saw that before we even got to Forrest. After we had um, were able to locate him, um, instead of just knocking on his door, we reached out to uh, his brother and some family friends. And they and we said, Can we, would you introduce us to Donald? And they told us that they would, in fact, introduce us. But if we messed with him in any way, they would track us down and get us. Oh, and we knew at that moment there was something going on in this community. There was a a protection and a force behind Donald um, that was 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 what you call community, really. And it was very spontaneous. It, it was very organic because we kept, you know, one of the th things as a journalist you try to do is like, why did figure out why is this happening in this community? And so we we kept going around to people over the years. We we, we first met Donald uh, in 2007, and he's um, he's turning 90 this year, um, and um, so he was in his 70s at that point. And we went around to people who had known him for for 70 years and said, "So why was this community so nice to this guy who was so different when in the rest of the world at those in those years people like him were treated badly and put away and shunned?" And we kept thinking there must be something about them. And they all said, I, we don't know, we just did. And then one person said to us, her name is Celeste Slay, she appears in the movie. She said, it's not us, it's him. He's just, there's just something about him that we all just love him. And it's, and it, that was a really interesting flip of the thing that it wasn't about them, that it was about him, which really is about them being able to see what they have in common with Donald. The, they, the wouldn't take common credit. they wouldn't take credit as a community. They, really, they gave the credit to to Donald for being the person that he was. But in fact, it took all of them to make it work, because Donald could not have been successful without the support and the love in his community. Exactly, John. Shall we go ahead and show the clip about Donald's happy life? Sure. You've been traveling a long time. Yeah. So the first diagnosed child, he's in his ninth decade of life now. November of 1989, that's where I went to uh, Australia. And he's doing things that nobody would have ever expected. So this is 30 years of travel in these passports. Yeah, yeah it sure is. Yeah. I get a picture from Germany or Iceland or Florida, <laughs> wherever he goes, you know, and I, I often wonder how in the world does he make it alone, you know. I don't like to travel alone. <laughs> he, he liked playing golf. Oh, 
gosh. He, and, yeah, uh, he did. Snow on the ground, if it's hailing, he's out there on the golf course. Don has a really unique uh, uh, waggle and swing, and if you've ever watched him go through the uh, motions of that, it's, it's uh, difficult to take your eyes away. You know, I think back to this little boy who was put in an institution in the 1930s. He's just come so far. And he really has it all. But Donald is sort of an outlier. Oh, thank you. Obviously, the whole discussion begs the question of if there had not been the respect for uh, uh, Mr. Beeman Triplett that the community had, if there had not been the network uh, of support, all of those things, would Don's life have turned out the same way? So that is just such a wonderful example of, I guess, a real a real win for the community, right? And as Karen, you say they don't really take credit for it. They just think that it's Donald, huh? I just love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know it, there's a, a piece where the townspeople, one of them neighbors or his friend says, we just know him as Don. It's hard not to love him. Mm -hmm. But that is not the story for every family who has a child with autism. So why is it that having a supportive community is so important? I know that's a theme throughout the book, but I just would love you to comment on the role that that supportive community plays. So part of the way we answer that in the film is by showing what happens to people who don't have a supportive community or the support breaks down at some critical moment. So you could see some of that in the trailer. You could see that there was a young man and he was in Alaska and there's a longer scene of it in the film. Uh, was was suspected by the police of committing a crime, even though he did nothing, because he was standing on a street corner, and he was he was looking in cars, and somebody thought he was trying to steal the car, and they called the police, and he couldn't explain what he was doing. He couldn't he couldn't process language quickly enough, and the police immediately cuffed him and threw him to the ground, and it got even more violent than that, which comes out of you know misunderstanding when there's somebody, especially somebody with power and authority who doesn't understand somebody on the spectrum, bad things can happen. We also portray the challenges of, of families with single parents and no resources, unlike Donald's family. Mm -hmm. There's a dad in the film that lives in uh, outside Cleveland, Ohio, who's raising a son on the spectrum. And his son needs support from his dad 24 hours a day. So his dad can't work. So that means his dad has like almost no income. And they're they're at the edge of poverty while trying to raise um, a child whose autism and is quite challenging and whose needs are very severe. It's examples of bullying, and you'll we'll see some of that, I think, a little bit later on, that especially in school situations that uh, kids on the spectrum are are bullied. It's an it's also a non-understanding that kind of comes on, you know, not for anybody trying to do anything wrong, but through the media. There's a kind of a, a, a fault on the part of the media, especially the media that makes films, Hollywood movies about autism, to leave out a large number of people on the autism spectrum. And those are the people who can't speak and who can't, you know, really live independent lives. They need to be cared for 24 hours a day. My brother-in-law who lives in Israel is somebody who's on that kind of the spectrum. And we're all for shows like The Good Doctor that portray autistic people in a positive light. But those shows are not making stories about people like my brother-in-law who can't speak. And we want we want to have that come across. So what we argue with the film, the film doesn't make an argument, the film tells stories, but the argument that's left from the stories is that um, Forrest, Donald's life in this town called Forrest was really an exception. And the ways that it can go wrong are are many, but the fixes aren't that hard. So police training fixes the police problem. And just a broader understanding of the spectrum, which our film aims to do, you know, gets across the notion about how broad the spectrum is and how challenged some people with autism are and why their families are struggling and really having a challenge. And the bullying one is obvious, you know, that there's, there's, um, you know, nobody wants to be bullied. People on the spectrum really are. But we tell the story of a school in Phoenix where they, they put kids 
together who are autistic and non-autistic kids from the age of three and a half. And so it just becomes like totally natural that that people who are on the spectrum and people who are not on the spectrum are friends. They grow up friends. And that that's working, at least in this community, at least with the 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 the, the kids that we focused on there. They made friends years ago and they're still friends. And one of those is on the spectrum and the other one isn't. So that's kind of what what we were really trying to get across in the film is um Donald's situation, as you say, was exceptional. It doesn't have to be. You know, because as you say, Donald's story shows a man who's having a happy life, but the history of autism is filled with some really scary stories. Yeah. Kids who were treated with hallucinogenic drugs and shocked with cattle prods and all of that stuff. Why, I mean, what is your theory about why those practices were allowed to be part of the history of kids with autism? Karen, do you want to take that or? Well, I think some of it is lack of understanding. Some of it is people looking for a solution. Um, they Most of these things, just like institutions, were not created to do harm. But in fact, when you do things to excess, that's what ends up happening. And um, I think that um, the 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 why don't you go from here, John? Well, another another challenge is the spectrum is so broad that there's no such thing as a one size fits all solution or 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 response. I'm not sure solution is the word I want to use, but response to autism and the um, the it's it's actually in some ways still it, it was never really very very clearly defined or really clearly understood what we mean when we say autism or that a person is autistic. Uh, and I say that because the criteria that have been used have changed many, many times over the years. And it's not a thing where there's a, a genetic mar, uh, definition of an autistic person. The, the, the gen genetics of people who are on the spectrum are very, very complicated. No, it was based on it was based on behaviors. It was based on do, does what does the person do or say, or how do they talk, or how do they use language or not use language. And all of that stuff can become very, very subjective and a little bit blurry around the edges. And so um, you have a diagnosis that's a, that's blurry around the edges, and it kind of invited um, all kinds of uh, specialists into the field, and all of the specialists kind of did their specialty. So the the medical people looked for drugs, and the behaviorists looked for behaviorism, and and the, and then there were people who got into it who shouldn't have at all, who were. But, who were, but even our, even the community of doctors of psychiatrists, they all got it wrong. Yeah. And, and as doctors, we listened to them because doctors were superior. And when the, the psychiatrist said it was the fault of the mothers, that that's why their children had autism, everybody bought it. And part of what, why this perpetuated is because when you have a medical community that didn't have the answers, they came up with things that they thought were the, were the answers without really, you know, without any scientific ev evidence. And, um, you know, decades of, of mothers you know, suffered as one one big example of how we often um, decide something without any any real knowledge behind it. You know, Karen, that reminds me that the the damage of that theory about the refrigerator mothers lasted for decades, right? But a major theme that I really responded to, and I know that's partly why we're here tonight, is the power of parents organizing getting laws passed, getting national organizations created, really they changed that whole outlook, didn't they, about how kids were by fighting for their own children. Um, why would you say that parents, I mean, I, I think the answer is obvious, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Why are parents so important to your story about the history of autism? Well, I think a lot of it um, starts with that, you know, the, the original diagnosis of autism with, with classic autism, most of those children couldn't speak. They didn't have a voice. The and, and those that did have a voice were to some extent like my son Mickey, who who wasn't independent. I mean, he might have had language, but he could not advocate for himself. And the only person who could advocate for these children were the parents. And we wouldn't be, you know, anywhere without um the the families that changed the laws and opened the schools and did the things. You know, we wouldn't even have the broad spectrum that we have today if parents hadn't um, 
you know, gotten their children out of these institutions and helped close the doors to things that were, you know, the terrible things that were happening to them. So I, I would say that it's more that it was a factor of who else was going to be the voice if it wasn't the parents. Yeah. There are some 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 autistic people have read our book and they've said and the criticism has been, well, this is a book about the parents, not about autistic people. And my response is it's actually a book about autistic people and about the parents. The parents were critical because what we did in making in writing a history of the diagnosis was to look at who were the people who made who who made change. And up through around 1995 or so, it was the parents who were doing it. Self-advocates became involved in the 90s, and they've made a lot of change since then. But Karen's made reference to a few things. The closing of institutions was forced by parents. Pushing back against the mother blaming was forced by parents. The beginning of the beginning of actual uh, biologically based research was driven by two parents out of New Jersey who who went to some conferences, you know, a brain conference, and 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 went around to all of the presenters who were talking about their research and asked how many people were working on an autism. But this was in 1991. And of something like 3,000 papers that were presented, only one or two mentioned autism. And they weren't really about autism. They were just comparing something to autism. And he and his wife went out and raised money to begin to persuade uh, to persuade researchers to start to study autism. The laws on public school education, kids on uh, on the spectrum did not have a legal right to a public school education until parents fought for it. The insurance that comes through for uh, for to pay for, for ABA therapy, that came from parents fighting for it. So parents have a very big part in it. And a lot of times when we're giving talks, parents will stand up and they'll especially ask Karen, you know, what should we do? And Karen, your response is always the same. It's don't stop fighting you know, just keep fighting. And I wish I had my book in front of me because we do a paragraph about that would really trust and boil down the importance of parental love and the power of the love of parents is uh, is so, is such a powerful force in, in the whole story of autism. When I mean, you tell the story about one mom, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, who literally was part of a group of moms that they were studying as being refrigerator mothers. Mm -hmm. And then she was really subversive and went and got the names of the people in that group and started her own support group to really go against that theory. Yeah, that was Ruth Sullivan. Her, yeah, she Ruth she Sullivan. only died last year. And so she started the first autism organization with um, a psychologist and she was in upstate New York and the psychologist was a guy named Bernie Rimland who was a very big figure in the history of autism. He was in San Diego. And um, they they got organized in the early 1960s when when as they say you didn't make long distance phone calls they wrote letters back and forth to each other they mailed letters to get this organization started but you're right she was she was in a group of women with a therapist with a psychiatrist in Albany New York and they were all brought together and the psychiatrist was going to work with them to figure out why they were all bad mothers causing their children's autism mm -hmm. and she just said this is nonsense and she said I'm going to go to one meeting and at the meeting as you said. She passed a piece, of, a note of paper around very quietly, passing it around to the other women saying, give me your phone number and your name. The, the, everybody wrote it down. She went home the next morning. She called all of them up and said, let's start. Let's cut out this nonsense with it's our fault. Let's start a group to do something. And that was a, that was that that was that parental love. And her son, Joe, was somebody that Dustin Hoffman spent a lot of time with when he was studying to play the character of Rain Man actually. Wow. Wow. That's a great story. Um, you know, because we work with a lot of parents through this organization, and it is especially the parents of kids with special needs and disabilities that we've been most impressed with. Our friend, Dr. Vikram Jaswal from University of Virginia does what he calls radical inclusion, that we really need to all of us focus on what it means to have an inclusive community. At the same time, we know that there's lots of bullying that goes on, right? with kids with autism in schools. And um, it's not surprising given challenges of social skills, but if you would, John, show that clip with Amy Gravino, because I think she has such a uplifting way of describing that struggle. If you were to look at photographs of me growing up, you would for a while, you'd see a very happy little girl. You'd see a girl without a 
control curly hair, and then a girl who gradually, by the time she was around 12, 13, stopped smiling. Even though I was diagnosed at the age of 11, the word autism didn't really mean anything at that point. I only knew that I was different and that different was bad. That was the response that I received from my peers. You're weird, you're a freak, you're a retard, you're a loser, you're ugly. These were the things that I heard on a daily basis. And what ended up happening was that the voices of my peers became the voice in my own head. But all of, the, all of my feelings about myself at that point were things that I didn't like. I couldn't... I couldn't point out things that I did like. And there wasn't a whole person there. And, and I wanted to die because I couldn't think of another way out. I remember the people who stood up for me. Here, hey, down here. <laughs> Stand up for someone who can't stand up for themselves. You know, lift them instead of putting them under your foot. So you may think that like what you're saying may not make a difference in, to this person, but believe me, it makes all the difference in the world. And they will carry that with them for the rest of their lives. That's a really beautiful clip. So John and Karen, what do you suggest for people who may feel unsure or not know how to lift up somebody who has autism or a parent with a child with autism? Do you have any suggestions? You've talked about how we really need to all become a community. Do you, again, any thoughts on that? You know, it, so much of it depends on where you are in your community and what what the situation is. If you're, you know, we, one of the mothers in our film, Amy Lutz, talks about, um, you know, being in a grocery store and her son, uh, Jonah, is, is, is very profoundly autistic. And, you know, if he were to knock down like a, a shelf full of, of groceries in a grocery store, instead of everybody sort of gasping and looking at her as this horrible mother, how about saying, I'm going to pick that up. Why don't you go take care of your child and just be the bigger person be the person who says i'm going to lend a hand just like you would if you saw somebody in a wheelchair who was having a hard time getting across the street anybody who's different you it, it's not again so hard to just be be a human being be a friend um be a caring person and you just have to think about it a little bit and and sometimes and this goes for the you know, employers, and it goes for people who are in business and anywhere in the professional community. Sometimes you may have to go more than halfway. And that's okay. Because people with autism are going more than halfway every minute of their lives. And, and it's okay if you stand up and you go, you know, 10 steps forward to make life a little bit easier or a little bit more understanding or be a little bit more compassionate than might come naturally. And there's a scene in the movie where Amy Lutz's his son, Jonah, who's, you know, he's a big guy. He's probably six feet tall and probably weighs 240, 230. Um, he doesn't have language. And um, he can act in ways that would be called, quote unquote, inappropriate. For example, and when you see it in the film, they take him to get a haircut at a hair salon outside Philadelphia. And he lies down on the floor right in front of the front door and, 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 and he has an iPad and he's focused on his iPad and he's just there on the floor. And we can all imagine the place where the management would come out and say, hey, get him out of here. Or the customers would complain or even somebody might call the cops. And there, the store, the management just says, no problem. It, there's There's a really, really, really good solution to the fact that he's in the floor and other people have to walk around him other people have to walk around him that that's okay that now that's a, that's actually like advanced advanced acceptance i think that that, that the, the managers of that salon really have come a long way from the way most people would respond they just don't see it which which means that they just don't see it as that big a deal not seeing the differences as that big a deal is still kind of an advanced degree for 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 the civilians at large but it shouldn't be because walking be. around a person who happens to be lying on the floor, who's not bothering anybody, is not such a difficult thing to do. Right. And right. I would guess that that children would see it that way, too. You know, yeah. 
if they're taught to see it that way. If they're taught to see it that way. Good point, Karen. That's the whole thing of, these, of the school that John was talking about that's in the film earlier is that when these children grow up side by side and then they see that everybody's different, you know, that's how you start to change society is that the children have to have to believe that we're we're all different yet we're all the same and we should all be treated treated equally you know when possible and if not then you be the big person yeah and and, and karen was mentioned companies i'm sure that there are people who are watching this who have had challenges on airplanes airplanes are like classically difficult situation dentists are also but there's just one dentist but on an airplane there are 300 other passengers and if the kid uh, with on the spectrum, you know, what, whatever, jumps up and down, runs in the aisle, jumps on a seat, throws food on the floor, whatever it is that that child might do. There's, there's two ways to, for the general public to respond to it. And one is to complain to the flight attendant. And the other way is to recognize that the kid has autism and to roll with it. Maybe help pick up the food. Maybe, maybe also just say to the parent, it's okay. Cause you, you know, so often you see parents of autistic kids of apologizing steady apologies stream of apologies to the civilians that that are around them and what's really lovely again in that hair salon is in fact amy lutz when somebody steps around her son does say oh i'm sorry and the woman says you don't have to apologize this, this is just a customer you don't have to apologize she said he's great so that's the little shift that makes a huge difference and that we want people who watch our film to get and to start making Absolutely. So we have really talked a lot about community and the importance of building community and belonging. And now I think it's time to invite Dr. Antonio Hardin back with us. So we'll take some questions from you, the audience, and give everybody a chance, if you haven't already, to put some questions in the Q&A. So welcome, Dr. Hardin. Thank you. I'm going to start with a question for you, um, because I think, you know, we are very fortunate. I'm actually from Palo Alto. I grew up in the shadow of Stanford. I went to school there. Your center is very special and having a resource like the Stanford Autism Center is very special. What do you recommend for people who may not live close to a similar resource or research area? Very good. Uh, good question. Um, talking about parent advocacy, family advocacy. Uh, I talked recently to a parent who uh, lived in a different state and had to drive from Indiana to uh, Kennedy Krieger in Baltimore, Maryland to get care for uh, her child, who's now in his 20s. And she's been doing that drive quite a bit over the years. So one thing that comes to mind is because of the way how we're structured, a physician in California cannot deliver care to someone in Nevada or in Arizona. That's probably, there are a lot of good reasons for that. But my thinking and my hope is that maybe parent can take that to DC and get an exception for some diseases where expertise is not readily available in their community. So someone who is at Stanford or at Kennedy Krieger or in Boston can at least make an evaluation and provide recommendation and sometimes provide care across state line. So that's something that I think with parent advocacy could happen for specific diseases, not for your regular headache or for your regular sore throat, but for some specific diseases where expertise is not available in your community being able to do that across state line or remotely, especially at a time that now we're more comfortable with this kind of uh, approaches compared to let's say three or four years ago. That's really important. So one of the things that we're getting some questions probably, I think from parents who have children with autism is um, about resources. So, and you all may have comments about this question. What advances are you seeing in states and communities for better adult programs and housing options? And what are the biggest gaps that still need to be filled? Karen, for example, we know that Mickey is in a, a situation in Arizona that's a long way from home. 
Yeah, I think that really um, the adult situation is still it's sort of where we were 20 years ago with children. Um, and we were starting to really figure out how to educate our, our young children with autism at an early age and see incredible progress by giving them the support that they need. And then they turn 21 and the saying goes, they fall off the cliff. And that's very true because there's very little out there. And as again, the spectrum is so broad that it's not one size fit all. all. So somebody who might need the support of a 24 seven um, program is, doesn't need the same support as someone like my son, who he he needs he needs he need he needs support, not twenty four seven, but he needs he he's going to always need some kind of support. But he's also somewhat independent. And on the East Coast, there was nothing like a first place for him when he started to go um, to school. And there were transition programs. There are there are small. There are some pockets of excellence across the country, like two-year programs. But then again, what happens in two years? And so how does a, a young person who wants to lead as independent a life as possible, but at the same time needs supports, do that? Well, you know, I was lucky as a journalist that I was able to find those kind of supports and services. And I did that, you know, for 20 years. What's the next step? How can I get there? Where can I find it? But most parents aren't able to do that even you know, when they're doing it, trying to figure it out 24 um, seven, we're getting a little bit better. There are there are a few more programs out there, but you know, all of these children um, that have autism become adults with autism. And if we don't find places where they can live, you know, happy lives, you know, society is gonna have a problem on their hands, not just the people with autism and their families. Very much so. Um, can and I add something? Can I add something? You know, absolutely. As as a psychiatrist and psycho, or like in in the therapy session, insight is very important. So realizing the problem is the first step. And right now we're realizing that kids with autism, they get older and they need support when they are um, in their twenties and thirties. And that's why, right now, I know it's not ideal. We still have a lot of work to do. But comparing what's available right now to what was available 20 years ago is a significantly more. Yeah. So the hope is that this will continue and we could keep pushing on that gas puzzle to keep developing programs, innovative program like the first place in Arizona. It's amazing. And maybe we need probably first places not only in Phoenix, but all over the country in every city. So individuals with autism can have a place uh, to uh, live in. And that's what uh, Denise Resnick, the founder of First Place, is trying to do. And she's trying to, to, to share that as far and wide as she can. And, and, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel over and over again. What we need to do is when there's something good, we have to take it and run with it. Um, and I, I, I see that happening, um, but it takes a long time. And, you know, and, and as you said, 20 years ago, I was living in New York City. There was not a program I could, I could get my child into when he turned five that was a fit for him. Um, and I moved to New Jersey. Fortunately, New Jersey was a state that had was one of the few states, you know, 25 years ago, uh, outside of California that had really good mm -hmm. services. But, you know, today you go to, if you, you move into New York, you can, you can get into, you can get your child into an excellent early intervention program mm -hmm. like that, because people, you know, 25 years later have figured it out. So, and Dr. Harden, I think since we have such an expert in you here with us, let's turn it back to the beginning of the journey for parents who may be new to this. Um, if a parent is wondering about their child, what are some of the first steps they should take and what should they be looking for? From a diagnostic point of view, from early identification. Uh, you know, parents uh, know very well their kids and uh, they know when something is not right. It's important to, when they feel that the development is not the way it's supposed to, to be able to seek help first with their pediatrician. And we know all the stories about the pediatrician that missed the diagnosis or they were not um, as good in identifying the difficulties. Being persistent and pushing for an expert evaluation is very important until they feel a little bit more comfortable with the diagnosis. 
as you are aware, this area is very hot in the field with more and more um, strategies to identify kids very early, as early as six months or one year using approaches like eye tracking or facial expression to be able to identify kids who are on the spectrum so they can be diagnosed early with the hope that they will start the intervention uh, soon after. So there is a, an area of field in the field where a lot of work happening with apps and the devices that will help with early identification. So for the best outcome, you want to identify and diagnose children early, is that right? Yeah, I think there is strong evidence that the earlier you start the intervention, the better. And we have evidence in the field of autism, but also we have evidence from most medical disorders. Like if you have diabetes and you start the treatment early on with first maybe a diet or maybe oral anti-diabetic, your outcome would be much better than if you sit on your high sugar for years before you start the treatment. It's the same for, for autism. The earlier, the better when the brain is the most plastic. Okay, thank you for that. So we have just a few minutes together. And but before I let you all have sort of a last word, here's a question for Karen and John. I love this one from the audience. How did you decide on the title in a different key? Um, we're smiling because we were, we were ha having a meeting at our publishers and we were kicking around ideas and um and karen had said um something like how about marching to a different drummer the what we wanted to get across was the idea that, that one existed already yeah yeah and what we wanted to get across was the idea that uh autism was not a it didn't make you an outlier it just meant you were a little bit different but mostly like everybody else so i'm smiling because um, and we're both smiling because Karen went to the women's room and when she came back, the title had been decided upon in her absence by the, the our editor and me. We both come up with this idea of in a different key and we say, hey, we've got the title. So it was, it was, I wouldn't say it was pushed on you, Karen, but you were out, out of the room when we struck upon it. And the idea of it is to get across the, the notion that um, we're all, we can all sing in a choir. And we can all make music and we can all make art and be beautiful and use our voices in one way or another uh, and have our songs count in the world. And some of us might just be a little bit out of key, a little bit out of a little bit out of tune with everybody else, but not so far that you're not part of the choir. And that's what the idea was meant to capture. Just a little a little bit of difference that may be a little bit noticeable, but maybe not that important. We hope you like it, Karen. It's a very beautiful title. <laughs> All right, it has been a wonderful session with all of you, but I do want to give you the chance for some final words. And Dr. Hardin, I'm actually gonna start with you. Very good. You know, and when I first the movie, when I first watched the movie and the people talked about refrigerator mother and it came up again here, I wanna apologize <laughs> for all the physicians who, <laughs> uh, have made mistake and they continue to make mistakes, especially in the field of autism. Autis autism spectrum disorder is a very humbling disorder because it's the, one of the most complex disorder that you can deal with from a neuropsychiatric point of view. I worked previously in the in schizophrenia and the schizophrenia world. It's kind of a Mickey Mouse <laughs> from a, a complexity point of view compared to, to autism without minimizing the challenges of uh, individual with schizophrenia. So it's very, it's a very challenging, it's very complex. When we think about where we are right now, it's probably maybe with maybe a hundred years behind what the, of the field of cardiology. 200 years ago, people used to listen to heart murmur and say, okay, you've got heart murmurs. Fast forward hundred years ago, 200 years ago. Now we know there are different types of heart murmurs. And that's where we are right now, maybe in autism, it's a behaviorally defined disorder, but maybe in the future with more advances in science, we'll be able to define a little bit different types of autism with hopefully disease specific uh, treatments. Let's see if we can keep you around then for a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Hart. And Karen, I'm gonna to go to you. There's so much about the film that to me speaks to your mother's love and the power of connection. So what words do you have for us? 
Oh, I think John sort of said it earlier for me, which is to just never give up and just believe in your child and fight for them. What, what, however, whoever your child is, they don't have to have autism. Really well said. Thank you, Karen. And John, back to you. I, I first have to start by saying to Dr. Harden, uh, we've never we've never heard in all of our talks uh, somebody apologize for the entire <laughs> profession of psychiatry. <laughs> Um, but but the, humil the humility that you bring to the challenge of, of of the condition is really very impressive, and it's I think it's why you make a, a difference, and you've made a difference in making tonight happen for us. As you mentioned at the beginning, we talked about this five years ago, and I can't believe it's happening. So I want to thank you for that, and and Leslie also. But I also really want to thank uh, Charlene and Bev uh, at the Parent Venture. Um, Charlene did an enormous amount of the nuts and bolts part of this happening, and it wasn't a piece of cake by any means. These things are complicated to do, and Charlene, uh, you gave it everything, so thank you for that. And what I would say, my, my parting thought is really a little story that I like to tell, and usually Karen and I tell it together. She might she might jump in at some point, but it's to illustrate the the the, the takeaway that we want to come from the film. I've seen in the questions that some people are kind of asking, how do we recreate forest or do I have to move to a small town to get to a forest kind of thing? And our answer to that is no. Um, be, and that's because, I mean, may, sure you can, but we think there's a different way to look at it. And that's kind of like that hair salon in in outside Philadelphia. That little place was a community because of the attitudes of the of the people who ran that place. But there's a story we tell at the end of our book that also sums it up. And it's a story about um, uh, that something that really happened on a bus in New Jersey back in 2006, where there was a young man, his name was Nick, who uh, was very, very challenged by autism. He had great learning difficulties, no language, um, not independent at all. But his family wanted to see if he could learn to use the public transportation system on his own, because if he could do that, it would like open up his whole world if he could like get on the bus and go somewhere all by himself. And so they put a huge amount of effort into teaching him how to use the bus system. And he was working with a teacher who worked with him for weeks, driving back and forth between the same two points early in the afternoon, this, in this town in New Jersey, just learning how the bus system worked and breaking it down into the little pieces so that he could understand it. And things were going really, really well. Um, and, and what had, was happening is that things were going so well that gradually the teacher was, was moving to the back of the bus and letting Nicholas ride alone on the front seat. And there were a lot of other passengers who were riding the bus between those two points at the same time of day, early afternoon, um, who were watching what was going on over these weeks. So they kind of, they were kind of catching on to the fact that this guy was learning how to ride the bus and that it was a big challenge for him and he was, and he was getting it. But one time, one day the bus came to a stop. Uh, during one of these practices and two guys got on and sat down behind Nicholas and they were not part of the regular bus crowd. I don't know where they were from, but they were basically outsiders. They sat down behind Nicholas and when the bus began to move, Nicholas began to rock in his seat and he began flipping his fingers in front of his eyes. He was stimming and then he began to vocalize, by which I mean he was making sounds, but not words. And so it, he was quite, you know, it's quite a, a set of autistic behaviors all at once. And uh, the two guys behind him, their response to him was to lean into him and start to bully him and to make fun of him and to mock him in front of everybody. And the teacher is in the back of the bus says, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to do something about this. And he stands up and he starts walking to the front of the bus. And then and all of a sudden, these, this other passenger jumps up and looks at these two guys and says, what's your problem? he's got autism, you know, why don't you back off? And at that moment, the, the bus became a community because the other passengers were watching out for Nicholas and the outsiders were the ones that were not part of the community. And it, it makes it it's so easy to see that it's actually not that hard for a small, group of people to form into a community to watch out for somebody who's different. So it can be in a supermarket. It could be in one apartment building. It could be on one block. It could be in one school. It could be one classroom in a school. It could be one group of friends, one group of neighbors. I'm not saying this is a piece of cake. I'm just saying you don't have to move to forest. You don't have to move to a small town 
for something like that to be engendered with the right kind of education and um, heart and commitment of good people to to want to be on the right side of this. We just think that they don't know. And we made the film so that they do know. And to show them a little bit, we keep saying this, how easy it is to have the back of somebody who's different. We are so grateful to you, Karen and John, for this beautiful film. Everybody who's been here tonight with us, we're grateful for you, Dr. Antonio Hardan. Obviously, your heart is here for these kids and these families. And thank you, everyone. It was an honor and a pleasure for us to support this event tonight. And we are so happy that you joined us. So again, take care, everybody. We will be sure to send out the video link again tomorrow. And for those of you who have not watched it, do watch it because that video window is closing soon. But I think, John, is it possible to get the film other ways? It's not public yet, is it? Uh, no, it, it won't be for quite some time. Okay. So so this this was a rare opportunity for people to see the film. Well, we've sent the link out every day for everyone who's registered. But again, everybody who's online, look for that link tomorrow, okay? Um, thank you, everybody. Karen Zucker, John Donvan, Dr. Hardin. It has been a pleasure and an honor tonight. Take care, everybody. And we hope to see you again soon. Good night. Bye, Bye everybody. You.